worship with this passage of Scripture this morning uh, from the Psalms. Let's stand together, and I want you to say this as one. Psalm 145, 3 and 4. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. Psalm 145, 3 and 4. Now while we're getting ready to sing the next song, speak a hello to somebody seated there close to you this morning.
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
hear Paul saying to that congregation in Corinth when they were getting ready for the Lord's Supper, basically, get ready. Don't come to the table unexamined, unprepared. It triggered a thought. Don't press it too hard. Just bear with me. But it triggered a thought. There were three of them, 10, 8, and 5, 30 years ago. They were ours. We brought them into the world. They hung around all the time. And every evening at mealtime, it was time for us to gather at the table, the three of them and the two of us. And supper came in the context of life. And invariably, there would have been a fracas preceding supper, a shouting match in the back of the house, a tussle over something that they both wanted at the same time, a fracas that involved me interjecting myself into the situation. Oh, I gladly volunteered for that i'd go back and speak a few words of wisdom Mm -hmm. do a few things to try to restore order and then would say to them in a loud fashion come to the table at supper time so here they'd come me cindy heather rachel and joshua around the table we had a routine hold hands you'd see them down there sticking out a finger at each other i said hold hands about that tone. And so they'd reach out with these limp little hands and touch each other. The one who happened to be next to me, Cindy was on one side, there was a child, a designated child sitting next to me. I'd grab their hand and squeeze it as hard as I could. And so my prayer would be prefaced by, Ow, Daddy, that hurts. To which I would say before I prayed, I meant for it to, now hush. And then I'd pray, a very godly prayer dear god please bless this food help these ungrateful children to appreciate what we do to take care of them and straighten out their horrible attitudes in jesus name amen and immediately we were blessed with a glorious meal you didn't come here detached from life you came in the midst of life You don't come able to leave it all out yonder in the foyer and pick it back up on your way out. You brought it with you. And sometimes in the midst of trying to have the Lord's Supper with the church family, you're tempted to just persevere, make it through. The amen will come and we can go home. I pray today that in some fashion, somewhere in here, God's going to break down those things that become walls. God will tear down those things that become barriers in our own minds and that he will allow us to see him, to hear him, and to worship him through that little wafer of bread and that little cup of juice. Heavenly Father, my prayer this morning is that we won't get in the way of you, that we won't be so full of us that there's no room left for you to move in us and through us. Father, if there is that that we've brought that is a problem, an attitude, something we've done, I would hope that we would have the courage, the fortitude 
to lay it before you and to name it, to own it because it's ours, and to ask for your forgiveness and your cleansing. I would pray, Father, that we wouldn't allow our humanity, the fact that we are all flawed, that we have sinned, that we fall short of the glory of God, to keep us from being your people, your family. And so as we're asking for forgiveness, I pray that we too would be able to forgive, to restore, to be unified by you, what you've done and what you're doing. We pray it in the beautiful name of, the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand together.
Sometimes it's subtle. At other times, it's like somebody took a ball-peen hammer and hit you right between the eyes. Inescapable. Unmistakable. Something's different. Now, it's not always easy to discern what that something is. You just know something's different. Perhaps you haven't seen them in a while. Or maybe between the last time you saw them and the now, it happened, whatever it was. You tread lightly because you don't want to say the wrong thing. You look different. You've opened up a can of worms there. You look different. And if you proceed with something like, you look great, then they can conclude, oh, I looked horrible the last time you saw me then. So you have to be careful. Maybe it's a new hairstyle. Maybe they've lost a few pounds. Maybe they had cataract surgery and they're no longer wearing their eyeglasses. Maybe, well, you don't know because they're not forthcoming and you're not sure, but something's different. As we approach the table, I want to take just a few minutes and give you a a word to prepare us for this sharing together of the Lord's Supper. Luke's account is a little different than Matthew's and Mark's and John's. They're all a little different because they had their particular perspective on the events. And Luke pulled together those stories given to him. Holy Spirit guided him and he gave it to us. When he got to the 22nd chapter and the 14th verse, he began like this, when the hour had come. It was time for the Passover meal. When the hour had come and the preparations had been made, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. That's just what they did. They didn't sit in chairs at the table. They weren't in pews at the church. They were in a room that had been borrowed, but it was going to be a somewhat informal gathering in that they all reclined around the table close. It was a familial scene. It was an intimate scene. He said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Then the mood changes. Luke interjects a note of somberness because he continues from that high and holy moment, as we would observe, and he says, But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. Whew, boy, we have taken a roller coaster ride here. Starting off slow and building to a climax and then dipping low and catching speed and going again until they came to a screeching halt at the end of the ride. And as they're hanging on for dear life here, it's apparent that there's something different about this. I observe these three movements. The first one, from ritual to relationship. Jesus gathered with his disciples to share that familiar yet significant meal. Not unlike this. If you've grown up close to Baptist, you've been doing the Lord's Supper for a long time, and you've done it probably in very similar ways, familiar ways. Back in the early days of my life, it was always on that Sunday, on the fifth Sunday night of the month. And so that meant you were going to do it once a quarter. That's, it had to be somewhere in the Bible, thou shalt observe the Lord's Supper once a quarter on the fifth Sunday night of the month. And so we religiously did that, and it was going to be done in much the same way. Oh, the service was going to be pretty much what it always was, but then at the very end, we were going to tack it on The deacons would serve, we'd all partake, we'd sing, blessed be the tie that binds. It was the Lord's Supper song, the only time we sang it. I knew we were going to sing it. I'd learned all the words, blessed be the tie that binds, and I hung on for that. I love that because it meant that a long-winded deacon wasn't going to pray that night. And, And when we finished the song, then we all went out. We could leave without a prayer. It was a miracle and so predictable. The Passover meal was like that. Oh, it was miraculous. The story was incredible, but it was routine. But here this night, there's a tension in the air because 
Jesus is taking this familiar, this routine from to someplace different, someplace unfamiliar. And it's now more than focusing on the, the bitter herbs and the salt water and the Passover lamb and, and the cup and the unleavened bread. Uh, now, all of a sudden, all roads pointed to Jesus. He became the focal point. He was at the center. And so now, now we're getting that this is more about him, who he is and who we are because of him, than about partaking of a particular element. Oh, the, the elements are important, the bread and the cup. They're important, but only important because they lead us back to Christ. You may be more comfortable with the ritual, going through the pattern, doing the familiar because it makes you feel good. It gives you a sense of security. But ritual can leave us with broken lives, with broken dreams and broken relationships. We go out the same way we came in because we've merely gone through the motions. Ritual can be observed. We can go through the routine while focusing on ourselves. Again, going out as we came in. I think that's one of the reasons when Paul gave us that great passage in 1 Corinthians 13 and talked about love, one of the things he said about love is that, that when you are affected by the love of God in Christ, when your life is being changed by the love of God in Christ, you be reminded that love doesn't keep account of wrong suffered. I interpret love doesn't keep score. Ritual allows you to keep score. You come in here and you can go through the routine and, and you can keep your scorecard in your pocket. Oh, you may not have a literal one. Some of you probably do. You've got that scorecard, and, and you remember the last word that offended, the last action that hurt your feelings, the last time that they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and it's all right there. And if they don't remember, you'll help them. You'll whip it out at any time. Oh, you can go through the ritual of church, of the Lord's Supper, and still hold on to the scorecard, not be changed. You see, trust in a relationship with Christ provides that opportunity to be forgiven. To have that weight of sin, that, that cloud that hangs over your head, to be forgiven and, and washed away. And to breathe deeply, physically perhaps, but more often than not spiritually. For the first time in a long time, the oppression is gone. The, the heaviness of life has been taken away. And in its place, there is a newness. Oh, same address, same zip code, same basic circumstances, but ah, something's different. Christ has changed you, forgiven cleansed and given a new beginning from ritual to relationship but also in this passage of scripture we see the movement from death to life oh, there was that stench hanging over the stench of sin now we can make it smell good we can make it look good ritual again allows that uh, we we can be religious without being spiritual we can go through the routine without having it affect us at all. And so what happens then is that you've got religious activity with the stench of death. Do you know what death smells like? It's not a good smell. The putrefaction of a decaying corpse, an animal, it's a bad smell. I mean, if you haven't smelled it, you need to sometimes. John, where'd you kill those hogs last night? Where could they find a decaying hog tomorrow if they were looking for one? All over. Okay. Just look for the buzzards. Go where the buzzards are. They know where the best corpses are. And you're going to be hit in the face by it. Whoa! That is horrible. That is a stench. Of course it is. It's the smell of death. But so often we dress it up and squirt a little Sunday perfume on it and we bring our spiritual death to church. And Jesus stood before his disciples and said, it doesn't have to be that way. There's a way for you to be removed from that, that pit of sin's death, that snare of sin's death, and, and for you to be enlivened. And that's why he said, uh, after he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. I'm making a way through me for you. I'll die for you. I'll take your sin on me for you. And you will be able to move from the death of sin into life everlasting. He took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Oh, we're no longer going to just 
tack it to your lapel as if it were a pin that you won for good behavior. It's, it's not going to be something that's on the outside that you can gain by doing certain things or not doing certain things. It's going to come as a result of Jesus doing something in you that only Jesus can do, taking you from death into life everlasting, from death. He was the only one who could take away that stain and stigma of sin and wash it away. Oh, we use that, oh, well, I'm just, this is the way I am, or I was born that way to justify so many of our actions and choices. I can't help myself. The fact is, I want you to look around just for a moment, not in an uncomfortable way. The fact is that all of us sitting in this room were born in sin and conceived in iniquity. There is not an immaculate conception in the room. There's only been one, Jesus the Christ. We're all born messed up. And, and it'll show itself. Give us time. It's going to show itself. It's going to become patently obvious. All of us sin falls short of the glory of God. Sinners cursed by the destructive power of sin. And guess, guess what sin does? Paul said the wages of sin is death. And what does death do? It stinks. It stinks. The only remedy for spiritual death is spiritual life. And the only way to spiritual life is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Christ took our death so we could have his life. Oh, that takes me to the last part of this. From betrayal to loyalty. I mean, we're on a high note here. We are, my goodness, this is so good. We've had the little piece of bread and Jesus said the blessing and broke it and passed it out. And we all took a, a bite unleavened as it is we've all enjoyed it and then the cup oh we all took a snort out of the common cup here we're going to give you a plastic cup and it's welch's finest and then all of a sudden he says oh and by the way the hand of the one who will betray me is on the table with mine Uh oh. what would that be like let me tell you exactly what it would be like if i were to stand up here this morning at this point in my sermon and say folks i just need to be honest with you can we get real for a, for a minute? I mean, we've done all the church stuff, and, and we're, we're doing all this high-level religion here, but, but I just need to be real. I need you to know that in this room, there is a dirty, rotten scoundrel. Their behavior has been despicable. They have said things that have hurt me, and by extension, they have hurt you. They have embarrassed us by their behavior throughout our community. They are a stain on the fabric of First Baptist Church. And if we want to be cleansed, if we want to get right, if we ever want to know the favor of God, they need to be outed, they need to be expunged from the record, they need to be sent out of this room even now. I wonder, what would we do next? I could just walk out, just leave the room. And you could be left to figure out who it is. Well, look around. You might have to make a short list first. Well, I got five or six prospects that it could be. I mean, I know a little bit of dirt on, on four or five people in here. And, and then you could narrow it down to your top three. And, and then maybe you could pronounce a winner and just wait to see if they would steal away. You know, this would be a very awkward moment for anybody to have to relieve the room. You know that, don't you? Don't leave. You can hold it another few minutes. But then what if, oh, no, what if it's you? I can't believe that for three years they've been hanging around with Jesus. For three years they've been hanging around with the other 11 disciples. And yet in that moment, you know what they said? I wonder if it's me. Judas had been right there in the midst of them. And he'd been blending in so well that they didn't get it at first that it was him. Could it be me? Well, and they felt a little guilty because just a little earlier, Luke gives us to us next. I think it was a little earlier perhaps. They were having this tussle over who was the head deacon, the head disciple, the head knocker, the man in charge. And they wanted Jesus to tap one of them so he could be better than the rest of them, and that didn't go well either. And so there had to be a little bit of guilt there. But you know what? You know where Judas was when all this was going on? Right there. Leaned up next to Jesus. And I will say this and believe this till the day I die. I believe in that very moment, at that very table, Judas had the opportunity to look into the eyes of Jesus and say, I believe. And his life would have been eternally changed. And we would have met him in heaven. Instead, you know what he did? He got up and excused himself because 30 pieces of silver were calling his name. 
You see, we can sit in here and cloak all this in our religion, but unfortunately, sometimes 30 pieces of something is calling your name. And we can go out and do our stuff and betray the Lord, while others in this same setting could realize, no, this is where it's at. This is who is at the center of life, and I want Christ. So as we share this little wafer of unleavened bread, as we take this little cup of Welch's finest, and we share it with one another, remember, oh, something is different. Something's different. And it's all because of Jesus. Deacons, if you would join me, and let's share together in the Lord's Supper. In that familiar setting where all the elements were pretty common to that Passover meal, he took that piece of bread and he, and he broke it and blessed it and made that statement, this bread is my body, which is broken or given for you. We're no longer just signing up for a movement. We're no longer just following along with the Pied Piper. This is about him doing something for me and I can either believe it or reject it. I can accept it or push it away. But this is for me. He's inviting me. He's inviting you to know him and to trust him. And that piece of bread represented the fact that he made the way. He gave himself for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for that great, great love so perfectly demonstrated in your son, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that we might have your eternal life. I pray that you will bless this bread as we share it together and remind us of how we can come to know you and how we may have already come to know you and to experience your life. In Christ we praise you. Amen.
gave it to them. He said to them, take this and eat this. This is my body, which is broken for you. So much of the time, it had been about rules and regulations and what you did do and what you didn't do. And he said, this is going to be different. I want to talk about a new covenant. And it's represented by my blood, which is going to be shed for you. It's not going to be external. It's going to be internal. And who you are and what you do is going to be dictated by what's going on inside you. Heavenly Father, thank you that you loved us so much that you gave us your one and only son who was willing to die on Calvary's cross, that our sin could be forgiven and we could have a new start, a new beginning. So thank you, Lord, for that new covenant, that new way of relating, of knowing you, and for you taking the initiative to make this way through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we praise you. Amen.
had given them the cup, he reminded them that night that this represents that new covenant, inside out, changes everything about us. You get the desired behavior, but it's because of a changed heart, more than an imposed regulation. It makes all the difference in the world. As often as you do this, do it, he said, in remembrance of me. Deacon, y'all can take your place here on the front. I'm going to ask you to stand with them. In just a moment, we're going to sing a benediction. But before we sing that, let me give you a Paul Harvey moment, the rest of the story. Just a few weeks ago, those same three kids and the same two parents sat at the table Without any prompting, before I was ready, I looked up and they'd already grabbed hands and were ready for the prayer. When I said amen, rather than shaking each other off, they grabbed hold a little tighter and held on for an extra beat or two. I sat there not smugly, not proud of me, because that wasn't the result of great parenting. That was the result of a great God who is in the process of changing us and making us into the people He wants us to be. Don't give up on yourself for Jesus' sake. And don't give up on the hard cases in your life for Jesus' sake. He can make the difference. Brother Tim, lead us in our benediction as we sing this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise